evening, everyone. On behalf of the Indian Museum, Ministry of Culture, Government of India, and Goethe Institute, Max Miller Bhavan, Kolkata, I welcome you all to yet another very interesting evening with experts from Germany and India. As you know that this program is part of an array of online programs uh, between September and October as a prelude to the upcoming exhibition at the Indian Museum titled Responding to Bauhaus Collected Research at the Indian Museum in Kolkata. It is indeed a one of its kind exhibition coming up jointly presented by Indian Museum, Ministry of Culture, Government of India and Goethe Institute Max Miller Bhavan, Kolkata. These programs are carefully and designed I and mean, curated just for you, featuring internationally renowned experts conversing and discussing about a variety of related topics to deepen your insights about the concept. Tonight, uh, we uh, will have a discussion, a moderated conversation on Bauhaus and pedagogy. Bauhaus, Shantiniketan, and modern design education in India. A school that her heralded in the new era of the Bauhaus, at, uh, that heralded a new uh, era, the Bauhaus and the world universities shared a drive uh, for educational reforms that from the early 20th century grew worldwide from across the board, criticism of civilization and culture. This discussion in the evening will focus on the sharing outlook of both worlds in the pursuit of a modern world university. It's a moderated conversation between Suchitra Bala Subramanian and Shuman Das Gupta and Regina Bittner. We are really honored to have them on board this evening. Before I hand it over to Regina, uh, uh, a couple of lines about her, although whatever I say is not enough about Regina. She is a cultural anthropologist and curator. She has studied cultural theory and art history at Leipzig University and received her doctorate from the University Institute of European Ethnology at the Humboldt University, Berlin. As head of the Academy of the Bauhaus Dessau Foundation, she curates and teaches the postgraduate and the cross-disciplinary programs on transcultural modernism in design and architecture research. She has been the deputy director of the Bauhaus Dessau Foundation since 2009. Her most recent curatorial projects include uh, Versuchstätte uh, Bauhaus, the collection, the permanent exhibition in the Bauhaus Museum Dessau. Her research interests combined cultural anthropological approaches in architecture and design studies with questions of decolonization, critical heritage, and its mediation in teaching and curatorial practice. Her most recent curatorial publication projects include design rehearsal, conversations about Bauhaus lessons together with Katya Klaus, craft becomes modern, the Bauhaus in the making, the household historic models of contemporary positions from Bauhaus, and many more. The Bauhaus, she was also a uh, part of the Bauhaus uh, exhibition in Des presented in Dessau in 2013, which was re-looking at the Bauhaus exhibition in Calcutta in 1922, an encounter of cosmopolitan avant-garde. And that she uh, did in collaboration with Catherine Trombe. So there's more that can be said about Regina. But I'll stop here and I will hand it over to Regina to take it further. Regina, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. And it's a great pleasure for me also to host um, this uh, evening session, the second one in the program that accompanies the exhibition in the Indian Museum. 
Before we immediately move in into our discussion about these two remarkable schools, Indian schools, you would like to talk about, um, let me sort of briefly introduce probably some thoughts in regard to this importance of educational reform in which on the one hand certainly the Bauhaus sits and is a very crucial and very powerful, even a very powerful <laughs> a sort of uh, institution in regard to the uh, sort of the definition and even historization of um, art reform school development in the 20th century. And at the same time, what we would like to discuss today, focusing also on two quite important and influential Indian educational, radical educational institutions, uh, Kalabhavan and Shantini Ketan, and the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. Both schools were on the one hand certainly in its foundations deeply interwoven with the social and political transformation in the pre-independent as well as in the post-independent India. Um, and at the same time, schools that were um, sort of um, platforms for a very transnational network of scholars, of artists, of intellectuals, of scientists. And within these network and within these platform functions, certainly also Bauhaus and its echoes, its ideas, and its publications plays a major role. When Shamista introduced myself as someone that had also the pleasure to um, be one of the curators of the recent so, exhibition for the new Bauhaus Museum, uh, it's been called, and this is a very tricky notion, Versuchsstätte, which rather called experimental, or experimental field Bauhaus. We, from its very beginning, when we started to think about how do we present our collection we from the very beginning thought we should have to focus on um, this educational ideas and it's and, and the learning and living community of the Bauhaus because that's at least in our um, perspective seems something that is still very topical it is very contemporary and I think uh, why we, we came up with this decision to say we would like really to introduce um, the learning and living community a school uh, in its process. So not so very much talking about the objects that are already known almost everywhere. So these are design products and the results of the school, but rather than introducing to our audience this process of trial and error, of experimenting and failing, of uh, sort of struggling for solutions and uh, also for sort of um, finding alternative paths for thinking as a rather multiple, uh, multi-voice, multi-vocal institution with various different personalities with different ideas and certainly as an institution that was extremely platformed and networked with various different institutions across the globe. So um, when I'm putting a bit of emphasis on this, on this aspect that it's seemingly something that for even for our contemporary concerns is still something interesting um, then even sort of for this today's evening discussion um, the sort of the focus and um, um, the, the perspective towards this educational models is even more interesting by looking into um, the two schools we would like to discuss today um, Shantini Ketan, the World University um, that was um, strongly also interconnected with um, the exhibition in 1922 the first encounter of Bengali artists um, together with Bauhaus masters. We've been talking about it last uh, Friday already um, and the way how then also actually this particular school was so interesting for um, the scholars as well as for the artists and curators that were engaged in that exhibition. And then the second institution we would like to talk about today, uh, the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, that was again um, um, a networked institution in the independent India, um, to a certain extent, even sort of constantly negotiating and balancing between, on the one hand, being a flagship for the modern India uh, in terms of pushing um, industrial design, uh, and on the other hand, trying um, to rediscover also um, cultures of making that exists for a long period of time in their local communities. And I'm very glad to introduce for uh, this for, for tonight two extraordinary scholars, excellent scholars in, in the field of um, studying uh, these two institutions. So it is uh, Anshuman Gupta, first of all, 
Um, he has uh, acquired his, his PhD from the Goldsmiths in London um, in the Visual Cultures Department in 2017. He did his graduation in art history from Kala Bhavan, uh, Visva Bharati University, Shantini Kitan, and did a postgraduate um, graduation in art history from the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Baroda in the 90s. Um, since uh, 1997, he uh, teaches his lecturer uh, um, in the Visva Bharati University in art history. Um, I got familiar with Anjuman, certainly in the process of the uh, Bauhaus project um, and uh, always enjoyed his talks and uh, his extremely wide knowledge about uh, this particular fascinating institution. So he was one of the uh, key figures also as a researcher um, uh, in the Bauhaus Imagenista team in India as a writer. So he did a couple of other exhibitions, for example, one of the um, important shows on um, Ramkin Kabach um, centenary exhibition um, in, that was uh, sort of organized in Chantini Kitan. And then also um, um, he did an exhibition um, on uh, um, Indian sculpture on the Santa family. Um, he has a wide range of publications, certainly also contributes to the Bauer's Imaginista genre. And then I'm also very pleased to introduce Suchicha um, Balasupramanian, our second speaker uh, for this uh, for this evening se session. Again, um, I am very familiar with Suchicha, <laughs> so we had a couple of fascinating experiences uh, during our journeys through um, Asia. <laughs> uh, she sort of um, um, was a um, teacher at the School of Design and. Ambedkar um, University in Delhi for design history uh, for a long period of time. Uh, her research interest uh, centers at the intersection between craft, design, and nationalism in India against the backdrop of decolonization and Cold War diplomacy. And her publications include Moving Away from Bauhaus and Ulm. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hear more about this kind of aspect. It was also published in the Voice Imagista online magazine, and certainly contributes also to craft and design in the Hindu way of life in the Encyclopedia of Asian Design, which was published at Bloomsbury Academic in 2018. A large volume, um, and then also imagining um, the Indian nation, the design of Gandhi's Dandi March and Nehru's um, Republic Day Parades that's been published in Designing Worlds, National Design Histories in the Age of Globalization that was published at Berkan in 2016. So um, I would like to hand over, first of all, um, the speech to Anjuman Deshgupta. So he's going to give a presentation around 20 minutes as we agreed upon. And then I would like to hand over to Suchitra. And after that, we hopefully come into a discussion about um, the ties, the connections, the correspondences and the course, uh, sort of, sort of uh, uh, dialogues between um, the three schools we're talking about. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, the, Anjuman, may I hand it over to you? Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh... Uh, I'll uh, straight away without biding much time in discussing, introducing the subject, I'll be sharing my screen because it's a rather longish presentation. So I hope I'll finish in time. Um, Yeah, I hope it's visible. Not yet, Anshu. Okay. But I try to share it. Uh, is it visible now? Yes. But you have to go to the presentation because uh, this is uh, a mail. Right. Just, yeah, just towards Bauhaus to the just click on the PowerPoint. That's right. Yeah. And you can go to the first slide. Sure. Yeah. Now you can see it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I begin my presentation without much ado. And um, 
is titled as Baha'u's and Pedagogy, Shantini Kitan is foundational episteme. Um, we'll just start with a brief comparison of these two schools, actually. Um, Bauhaus and Kalabhavan emerged out of two different circumstances. The first from war ravaged industrialized Germany, the second from a colonial situation, but both of them arose from a similar quest for freedom from the existing conditions of life and education. Both of them connected art with other social practices. The Bauhaus founded in Weimar in 1919 after the end of the First World War, rose as a consequence of the German November Revolution as a school for design of a new kind. At the Bauhaus, a generation gathered with its teachers and students wanting to end with its nationalist, militaristic and statist past. The artistic and creative avant-garde and their radical pedagogical ideas shaped the Weimar Republic as the first democratic society in Germany. The transformation of the environment and the combination of art, crafts, design and architecture was also intended to reform existing social conditions, new creative practices, working methods and forms of life were aimed at liberation from the redundant practices. In India, meanwhile, uh, 1919 was also a turbulent year. The colonial repression in several sectors were increasing. It was a year of the Jallianawala Bagh massacre when in protest against the killing of unarmed civilians gathered in peaceful demonstration by the colonial government in Punjab Rabindranath Tagore, the founder of the university in Shantiniketan, returned his knighthood. Three years earlier in 1916, he had written a parable, The Parrot Still. This was obliquely a critic of repetitious and decontextualized education and its absurdity, written in the context of Calcutta University adopting a standardized syllabus. And in 1919, in Shantiniketan, when he had been running an idealistic school based on the ideas of Forest Armitage, to go try establishing a new kind of informal higher educational system leading to an international university. In the course of their processes and through their 100 years of history, these two institutes in Weimar and Shantiniketan became connected by many visible and not so visible contact points. This essay, this kind of presentation tries to compare and uh, every, even without comparing sometimes implicates the inflections in the two pedagogic models. Kalabhavan beginning, Kalabhavan's beginning was on a small scale within a colonial context and with an anti-colonial attitude towards education and life in general. It moved from a more idealistic tapovana or forest school educational model towards an experimental university. The course of study was without a defined curriculum and premised on attention to everyday practices. In 1919, it was a small community with a few students uh, the 1921 list shows 24 students, out of which three girls and 21 were boys. Although Kalabhavan started under the principalship of Asit Thaldar and Nandalal Bose joined permanently as principal only in 1922, his visits to the art school predated the inception. Each time, Nandalal was formally welcomed by Rabindranath himself, who was keen on his joining in the foundational effort. The spirit of the beginning rested on the two favorite terms coined by Tagore, construction and creation. The list of students from 1921 is a kind of conglomerate of uh, uh, multicultural atmosphere that was there. It's kind of indicative of multicultural atmosphere that was there. Hirachad Dugar, Audendu Banerjee, Warrior, um, Hiren Krishna Dev Burman, uh, Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, Ramin Chakraborty, Vinayak Masoji, Birbhadra Rao Chitra, uh, Haripada Roy, Kiran Bala Sen, Sabita Tagore, Sukumari Devi, and P. Hariharan, Bhaman Shirodkar, Mani Pradhan, and Satyendranath Bandhapada, and so on and so forth. So it shows a rather kind of all over India spread. These two are the pages from that time, 1921-22, showing the list of students handwritten by Nandalal Bose and signed by the students themselves, Siroster. Many discourses and multiple constitutive points of view are associated with the foundation of the university at Shantiniketan. During one of his journeys to America in 1922, uh, 
we find Tagore reflecting thus, in the modern time, I quote, in modern time, with all its facilities of communication, the access to in is free has become most difficult. And then I quote, yet I belong to the Isle of Innisfree. Its true name is Shantiniketan. <coughs> now the reference to Innisfree comes from a poem by W.B. Yeats. The name comes from a real island in a lake of the same name and its uninhabited island where Yeats spent his childhood. Tagore compares that quiet island with Shantiniketan, which on the one hand is associated with his intimate nature romance, his seeking of solitude. <coughs> his disheartenment with the existing educational models is emphatic in these following sentences, as was in his parrot tale. I quote, our co colleges, which are factories to produce clerks, have no place for music and fine arts. The colleges which you have named national also have no place as the necessity of this, these in social life is being lost. Kego's thoughts on the alienation in industrial society are distributed throughout his exchanges during this period. Sometimes they're plain critics and at others, a call for unification of humanistic values. While reviewing Creative Unity, his book of essays published in 1922, Times Literary Supplement remarked on Tagore's Vishwabharati University in Shantiniketan. I quote, what he says in depreciation in the type of education established by the British in India is probably only too true. Those who introduce them never turn their thoughts to the first principles and ask precisely what education is intended to accomplish published in Modern Review. Rabindranath does raise this fundamental question and the ideal of an university, which is sketches really brings thought and imagination to bear upon the problem. His university is not to confine itself to intellectual culture, but I quote, cooperate with the villages around it, cultivating breed cattle, spin clothes, press oil from oil seeds. That is kept that it kept the provision of openness and non-deterrence to all the caste, creed, sex, race, or class was quite modern for the circumstance. Now these ideas needed translations. Shantiniketan, the legacy of a poet school was conceived as an art conglomerate. Studio practice was emphasized as was extramural practices. The concern for degrees or diplomas was not there in 1919. Prospectors mentions number one, Vishwabharati is for higher education. Number two, the system of examination will have no place whatsoever in Vishwabharati, nor is there any conferring of degrees. Number three, students will be encouraged to follow a definite course of study, but there will be no compulsion to adapt it rightly, tightly. This new experiment in pedagogy by the artist teachers of Shantiniketan involved an understanding of cultural specificity and hybridity, as well as an adoption of selective disjuncture from the continuities with tradition in their methods of teaching and their art practices. Now, we'll negotiate them through a few stoppage points which will implicate both Bauhaus and later developments in India. First of all is community, because he thought art and culture to be sustainable, you needed a community, a sustainable community, and this community in turn sustains that art and culture. Letters from various places formed a very important role for the sustenance of this community. A letter in the wake of Karu Sangha, which is a craft guild comprising of artists uh, willing to do craft to sustain themselves formed in the 1930s. Here there's a point of comparison between what was uttered in the inception of Bauhaus uh, uh, may be brought to mind, actually, so, so the appreciation by Etienne, Etienne and uh, Gropius, both of the Gothic, along with the, uh, the Indian past, um, uh, they appreciated because they thought it rests on the craftsmen, on the, on the quality of the craft. Uh, these are the founders of the Karu Sangha in uh, 30s, wherein um, Nandalal writes, the founder artist Nandalal Bose writes to 
one of his first batch of students who became the main mover of Karu Sangha. Uh, that uh, he writes very pragmatically about the works, the commissions that he is getting for the uh, National Congress for 400 paintings of very precisely mentioning the price also, each four honors, which was uh, kind of, you know, a paltry sum by today's standard, but at that time it had some value. So he's communicating the pragmatic aspect of survival of the artist uh, to the artist and getting procuring or securing order and transmitting them to the artist. Here in another postcard, he's actually, uh, he's visiting, he's uh, returning from the Congress exhibition and there on the way he's, he picked up these pots and painted them, drew them on the postcard and sent it to his, one of his students uh, because collection was also emphasized, collecting art and craft was also emphasized in the, as part of the education. And uh, this, in this postcard, he's reporting back on the graphic workshop, uh, lithographic workshop in which they were participating. So he says, he had a trend of working on litho persist. Uh, Bon Bihari, Sutan, Surain are uh, working on litho. I made a drawing book on full-fledged human figures. I wish to see the modeling of the peasant you did. How big is it? Political sky is darkening, etc., etc. Dwellings. The multiple experiments in building new types of houses from that time on. This is apart from what uh, you see in the Tagore House complex. This is the part of urban building where the uh, basic secondary education is imparted. This is the first hostel and the, at the inception of which a student draws it and it was published in the uh, Vishwabharati News. It's the new Kalabhavan hostel it's called, actually it's called Black House today drawn by, I mean, Utkat done by Ram Kanai Samanto, a student of the time. Uh, where on one wall, an Egyptian motive is cohabiting and reciprocating the neighboring Bharut Yakshi. Uh, and then on other wall, you might see an Assyrian lion Nandalal <clears throat> so advices were wide ranging. And here there are kind of a couple of examples of building designs that he sent to some of his students and colleagues and also uh, community people, the dwellers of the place called ashramics, who he sent these uh, drawings and design solutions for their houses that they wanted to build. The left hand side is something anthropologically interesting because they traveled around and picked up even the examples of uh, motifs and uh, ritual diagrams and ritual objects used in uh, various rituals. And, and this is from a Buddhist ritual from which he uh, drew them from Darjeeling Hills and sent it to um, one of his students. Everyday life made the cycle of practices and their layers. Alpanas or decorative and ritualistic patterns largely practiced erstwhile by women, um, here practiced by men as well. Uh, and students picked up those designs and I mean, changed them to, their, to suit their circumstances. Uh, furniture to home decor to objects of daily usage connects Sriniketan and Shantiniketan, which is just neighboring places, which opened in 1922 and, and a route to the public life through the fairs and expositions. There are many other methods adapted to disseminate the aesthetic ideas, such as public murals and sculptures and architecture, which are strewn in the campus in the 30s and 40s and were extended in the 1970s uh, through our 21st century. You can see one of the most known examples, the Santal family way back in 1938, where Ramkin Kabej, one of the best known Indian modernist cultures, which negotiated the public space and was one of the most favorites of Tagore. 
Now, demonstration wall, which shows the process of mural making, uh, was also uh, a very important. You can compare them with almost Eaton's diagrams or his experiments with teaching. The first phase of Bauhaus totally kind of there comes very close to the first phase of Kalabhavan experiments. These are the uh, murals, which are all on the, um, on the veranda of, on the corridors of Prathabhavan. This shows the, the life, everyday life in campus. This is by Nandalal Bose showing the everyday life in the campus. You can see people kind of uh, you know, dusting in the morning and so on and so forth. This looks like a spring weather and so on and so forth. So out in the open, everything is in display. So uh, basically, you, it's, it's a living museum to some extent. Uh, so you can actually uh, live among, amid the art objects and basically learn from the outdoor itself. So that was emphasized and that is to be in consonance with nature. Um, now this is a kind of wall with, which is from 2011 by KG Subramanian and um, which tends to show the, the epiphanic utterances by various artists some of their favorites, like one of them reads like, uh, these are of, made of tiles, actually painted upon tiles and then fired and then fixed on the wall of the Master Moshe studio, which is the Nandalal Bose studio in the center of the college. In a Japanese poem, the poet expressed his desire to become cherry blo for blossom. Man is much greater than a cherry blossom. Then why is such an odd desire? Because human being is human being, they want to be something else, want to extend his being in different directions and become this or that. Man want to remain human, but also want to be cherry blossom with enormous complexity, unfathomable beauty, unending mingling with all this. And by overcoming all of this, he wants to be a cherry blossom. Kunala Jataka, which is a kind of uh, story of past lives of Buddha, Jataka stories, has tales of Kama Loka, that is the realm of desire, and Rupa Loka, that is the realm of forms. And above that is Arupa Loka, which is realm of formlessness or feeling or transcendence. I would say above all this is the realm of joy, which is Ananda Loka. This is a quote from Nandalal. Dissemination of aesthetic instructions through the habit of collecting the objects and images from all over the world help build an archive and a museum. These are a few pages of the museum book. You can read the top reads Kalabhavan Museum. And um, these are a series of drawings made of those objects that are collected on in the process of their sojourns to uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. These particular ones are from there. These are instruments, instruments and his picture postcard from Java, his painted postcards, one of those many fantastic postcards of a Javanese dance. And primers. This is, these are two pages from a very famous primer called Sahaj Path, done together with Rabindranath Tagore, uh, Nandalal Bose, Lino Cuts. There's a proof print, actually, I'm showing from the archive. Part of the pedagogic method are the instructional manuals, which came up in the process. Three comp uh, comparators left to right are Nandalal Bose, Vision and Creation, Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, Adhunik Shilpa Shiksha, or Modern Art Education, a page quoting, which is a, this page, middle page, is quotation from Nandalal's teaching method, later to compare with Bauhaus. Uh, and on the right, you see Gauri Bhanja, a teacher at Kala Bhavan, Nandala's daughter, following up with a nature study to turn into a motif of decoration for craft slash art, kind of bridging between art and craft. These are Nandala's exemplars for trees and their variations. They're almost kind of pattern-like appearance. It makes it easy for the artist to turn them into flat designs 
utilize it for drawing, painting, and translate them into um, decorative objects. So in a sense, multi-phase, multi-stable drawing practices, which was practiced over there, and the manuals were drawn by Nandalal himself. And some few more pages. On the left is a demonstration of spinal rhythm of various animals and birds. The spinal rhythm, he said, he emphasizes, you can see the spine is being emphasized there. The spinal rhythm of every animal is distinct. So he drew upon that. And it's an observation made on the more or less Eastern art practices, largely Chinese, Japanese, and Indian. And he drew a kind of essence out of them. On the right, you can see that the uh, various comparators make them metaphors and like a uh, sea wave looking like claws of a dragon on the top and sea wave looking like fire. So kind of metaphors he drew from Chinese and Japanese art practices. The Book of Modernity and Modern Art Education was written by Vinod Bihari Mukhopadhyay, and uh, right and left are two pages of that, the cover and the inside page, um, which is quotation from Nandalal. And here he is trying to emphasize the relationship of gathering material from the nature and transformation of them into a kind of a coded value, coded design. These are interpersonal exchanges between him and ex-students and the day of his retirement and many other instructional postcards. This is a postcard from reporting back on the opening day of after the holidays. And with this picture that is drawn, it was exhibited, enlarged and exhibited in uh, Imaginista in Berlin. Um, and these are a few pages of book design, etc. cetera. Mm, and uh, also instruction <laughs> from May I ask you to uh, shorten your presentation? Sure, sure, sure. Too much. Not be long, yeah. Sure. These are other postcards from the British Museum. The border between the intimate and the public were breached by the communication devices, such as the postcards, thousands of which communicated the intimate everyday life, as well as the communicable aesthetic experience of the often traveling artist and also instructional cards, posting design, and art instructions to each other. So these are kind of, uh, you know, reflections of how a language was formed or art as art was looked at as a language, how the conventional vocabularies were picked up from traditional art and transformed into a language for usage, language in use in the contemporary terms of that time as they thought. This is a mural in the China Bhavan of everyday life in, in Kala Bhavan by Vinod Bihari Mukherjee. This is another mural in Hindi Bhavan of the medieval saints. The pictures of the furniture which were developed here uh, after the exposure to Japanese experience by Ratinath Tagore and Kim Taro Kasahara and the low height of them tells volumes about this innovation in design as well as new value coding for design. It's a low height uh, table, uh, first saw in China and then he liked it and Nandala liked it and sent over for a design replication. Right inside you can see that pot that uh, Nandala sent as an exam exemplar to one of his students, Prabhat Mohan, and he he in turn collected it. These are some of the announcement for uh, festivities done by the master himself and some more fun on themselves, the community. Shantiriketan was an overall model making exercise built towards an ever changing and ever expanding model where creation and construction of private and public energies would synthesize in a social world for a free thinking and disseminating atmosphere. We can see, we can end with this where Nandalal punts on one of his dear colleagues, whom the, um, the ducks are nudging for food 
because the kitchen is closed. Thank you very much. I'll end it here. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Regina, for. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Anjuman, for this very yeah. comprehensive overview about the history of Shantini Kitan of Kalabawan and its really remarkable uh, pedagogic approaches towards the reform of art education in India. And, uh, and the original material you have been showing um, gives quite a sort of really interesting insight into the widespread uh, dimensions and aspects the school has invented. We have certainly a couple of aspects we would like to take later on together to talk mm -hmm. together also with uh, uh, Suchita Balazukramanian, for example, the way how you described the, the constant engagement with the campus and its transformation as a crucial element within the formation of this new community, or actually uh, this learning from local traditions um, and being very sensitive towards actually this local knowledge of making and crafting. So I think we find a lot of um, parallels, hopefully also uh, when we talk together then about um, the National Institute of Design. And I would like to give the floor now to Sujitra Balasukramanian. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, that you also agreed uh, to contribute to this panel. Um, and again, thank you very much, Anjuman. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Thanks. Thanks, Regina. Um, I'll get started straight away. You'll just help me to see if uh, my screen is shared. Yeah, there. Yes, it's shared. You can go for it. That's right. Perfect. Just one second. Um, did my script ready? Um, <clears throat> is it okay? You have to go full screen. Just click the yeah. Just click that. Yeah. Perfect. Um. Sorry, I'm sorry, I need help. I need to see my script. How do I do that? Uh, okay, um, just open your script. Yeah. And keep it aside. And when you screen share, you have to just select this particular window so that we can see the screen share and you can yes, also I'll see stop and do it again. I'll sure, stop you can do that. Yeah, so I'm very sorry about this. Um, That's fine. Yeah. Is it full screen for you now? No, just click that. Yeah, perfect. Can you see your script also? No, I can't. <laughs> um, sorry, just give me a minute. Sure. Um, Oh, uh, gosh, I'm not able to do it. So Chitra, you can also uh, stay with this sort of presentation if you see your script, then if it's not full screen, it's also fine, I would say. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. I think uh, I apologies to everybody. I'm not able to swing this. So, um, not, not a problem. We can still see it. Okay. Uh, thanks to all of you for inviting me to participate in this panel discussion. Um, so, as from Anshuman's uh, presentation, we can see that a hundred years ago or so, a striking Indo German or maybe transnational interaction took place which has thrown, I think, a long shadow um, and almost a hundred year old shadow. And my own interest has been on how Bauhaus pedagogy has been adapted, morphed, reviewed and extended in post-independence India in order to stay relevant. So I'll focus on the way a vision for modern design was articulated, how this translated into the classroom experience and learning uh, to, to the classroom experience in learning and how that in turn related to the world outside. Um, I think this is going to be really difficult. Um, okay. 
So in 1961, India's first prime minister noted how glad he was to learn of the establishment of the National Institute of Design, of Industrial Design, and he thought that such a design institute is certainly needed in view of our development in many ways. It was then a little over 10 years since independence and the role for modern design was clear, nation building and providing a standard of living for Indians. Um, Charles and Ray Eames, who were invited uh, to draw up a plan of action for modern design in India, they were invited by Jawaharlal Nehru. And in their India report, the contours of an institute for design education was drawn to hasten the production of the lotas of our time. They described in their report those perfect pots which were for them the metaphor for good design anchored in the cultural life of India. India at that time had two um, design magazines. The first was Mark. Uh, they were art and design magazines. And the first of them was Mark. And both uh, the which had commenced publication just a little before independence in 1946 and the editorial in 1948 called for a new Bauhaus for India while its advertisements give us a glimpse of the em emerging middle class aspirations. The other magazine was Design, which began uh, publication in 1957. It had former Bauhaus members in its editorial board. Uh, one of its issues condoled Walter, Walter Gropius's death in 1969, and yet another uh, article was uh, by the art historian Jaya Paswami, which assessed the achievements of the Bauhaus for its readers. So we can see that the Bauhaus was referenced several times in the circulating magazines of the time. So the National Institute of Design, as it was for finally named, uh, was established in 1961, and it came into existence at the intersection of post-colonial aspirations to design a new nation and a new citizen. It was located in Ahmedabad, a medieval Western Indian city on the banks of the river Sabarmati, and discussions began on the appropriate educational philosophy and pedagogy. So the question was, who would produce new lotas for the new nation? Who would teach them and how? A key figure uh, in, in the discussions on a new educational philosophy at the NID was the founding chairman of NID, Gautam Sarabhai, who outlined an educational philosophy with supporting organizational structure and culture that would guide individuals and groups towards cooperative and purposeful action, as he termed it. The NID was to provide professional education the defining characteristic of a profession is that, quote, its practice is required by its society, involving not only teaching theory, but practice under supervision, that is to learn to know and to learn to do. Such learning would take place through apprenticeship, apprenticeship where teachers would be able to retain the respect of students only if they themselves practiced. Practice would also provide opportunities for the application of intellectual rigor and ingenuity to the, quote, messy, complex, multiple variables of community life. Sarabhai also said that as the prime institution in an undergraduate's life, uh, an educational institution needed to offer a model of other adult authority, which was not punitive, but provided opportunities for students to acquire knowledge and discover for themselves to what use they wanted to put this knowledge. The educational philosophy also proposed building trust between uh, teachers and students uh, in, and try to pursue an ideal balance between authority and responsibility. It's important to state here that these ideas were drawn from Sarabhai's interest in psychoanalysis. Uh, he was interested in the ideas of Erickson and the development of um, the stages of development of life in an individual's um, lifespan. He was influenced by the ideas 
of Freud and Alan Rowland, and also the early collective of teachers at the NID were interested in educationists and philosophers such as Ivan Illich, who had visited Ahmedabad in the 1970s, J. Krishnamurti and Gijubai Badeka. The question is, how did these ideals translate into a program, courses, curricula, and pedagogies? Other design schools also were involved uh, in the creation of the curriculum, notably the Royal College of Art in Britain, as well as the Swiss School of Graphic Design. But it was at this point that NID's connection with HFG Ulm, the successor school, so to speak, of the Bauhaus, began with the visit of Hans Gujelow to NID in 1965. <clears throat> So here is a visual of um, Gujello with teachers at the NID, the first batch of um, um, teacher trainees. And Gujello observed a society. He came to Ahmedabad and he observed a society where, as he said, the influences of the technologically oriented West were colliding with the society, which was in the process of creating a secular state based on socialism and economic pl planning. In his observation, it was also a society which had the strong inclination to hold on to existing values for as long as possible instead of turning to the new, <clears throat> where neither the rich nor the emerging professional classes proved itself a leader in terms of taste and new products were accepted by the common man without discrimination. So he saw NID as a central place which, be, which would be in a position to make everyone conscious towards desire for quality. And since the profession of the form designer was still completely unknown, the Institute could play a pioneering role in this regard. And most importantly for our discussion, he observed that Indian in universities attached great importance in, on passing exams and getting good grades. And herein lies the task of the Design Institute, he felt, to point completely in a new direction and to propagate a new attitude towards training. Gujello's report ended with details on the development of a basic course for industrial designers developed in Ahmedabad in collaboration with the teachers at NID. At first glance, it seems like the, um, there are close overlaps with the basic program at HFG Ulm, as well as kind of echoes of the Bauhaus programs. There were elements of design, there was science and technology and seminars on history. And in the second and third years, he recommended that courses should present a natural progression into form studies and uh, other aspects of industrial design, which the students would uh, take on as they advanced into their studies through the years. Most of the elements of this foundation course was developed mainly for the training of potential family members, uh, fa faculty members, but it found its way into the basic course for the students also. So here we can see a glimpse of the Ulm inspired um, curriculum and the work of the students. If we go on to what the students were doing and look at it in some detail, images of the undergraduate um, work, and this is these are the images I now show you are contemporary work. They look as if the um, curriculum from Ulm was just transplanted at NID, but uh, a closer look can show us some changes which were made in the 1970s. So these are e examples of the exercises which it looks were just transplanted. And you can see the impact of the Basel School of Graphic Design in some of these color and, uh, color and composition exercises. But in 1975, about a decade after the Sarabhai document, Mohan Bhandari, the architect of NID's foundation program, wrote foundation program at NID and approach, which reveals how the educational philosophy outlined in the Sarabhai document melded with the Ulm experts suggestions and translated into curricular pedagogy and classroom assignments and transactions. 
but he began also to have a critical view by in the early 80s. The document he wrote opens with a detailed analysis of the period 1970-75 when the Ulm exercises were implemented and the foundation program at NID struggled, as he said, to evolve an identity of its own. Bhandari felt that there was something very vital lacking. Learning was becoming more and more classroom oriented and students seemed to, in a way, he said, sleepwalk through the classroom studio hours. He felt a new framework was needed to rectify this downward spiral. The document goes on into an ex introspection on the inadequacies, inadequacies and in fact the destructive influences of the Indian school system and its debil debilitating effects on the learner who arrives at the NID. Bhandari felt that the Indian family, community and religion along with the school system provided a rigid and regimental setting in the early impressionable years of childhood at the cost of an exploratory curious spirit with a questioning attitude. This led, he felt, to approval seeking, which totally cur curtails a student's toleration for confusion or ambiguity, which is in an inseparable uh, element, he felt, from the exploratory pro process of learning. Only an experimental form of learning, he said, would enable youngsters to ask certain fundamental questions about the present nature of our society and not take its existing status quo for granted, which is in a way opposed to the society's own safe concept of convenient socialization. So he set about trying to re reframe the foundation program. Some elements of the Ulm model were retained, as we can see uh, in, in the drawing uh, uh, courses in the foundation program. Uh, <clears throat> so the language of quick visual observation, the language of visualization of ideas and material explorations, all this was retained. But it was clear to him that the Gugello exercises by themselves would not create this vital sense of ethical purpose that was envisaged as the critical attitude required for a designer in India, as they were essentially classroom based skill training activities. So Bandari then proposed including an environmental awareness component into the foundation program. And this is the first real departure uh, which we see uh, <clears throat> from Bauhaus and Ulm. And he felt that the city has to become a real life classroom to be bring students closer to the realities of their country and underline that this must happen in their education in the form of a formative stage before entering any kind of specialization within design. And this is how the environmental exposure course took place. And I'll show you now some contemporary, uh, recent, not contemporary, recent works from uh, NIT students which shows how this environmental exposure course took shape. Students chose a micro environment in the city and conducted a detailed ethnographic study on the inanimate components, shops, homes, places of worship, food carts, and so on. They also looked at the human uh, uh, actors, women, men, children. Um, let me show you one. <clears throat> and make actually a detailed study of what was going on in the in the home and outside and their interrelationships. It was proposed that the area, this micro environment in the city would be studied over an entire semester of four months, recording changes over a single day and over the entire period, seasons, festivals, civic disturbances and so on. And Ahmedabad, we might remember, is a city prone to ethnic violence. All these were to be recorded with the skills that students learned in the classroom. So it was a way of taking the classroom out into the city. <clears throat> Equally, understanding the histories of the people and place was encouraged to contextualize the present form which was experienced by the student. This stage was to be followed by a second one where students would identify the problems in the environment that related to different patterns of behavior and attitude. Uh, this course provided students with a deep first-hand insight into real-life situations with a cumulative uh, result in terms of understanding the city as a whole in many parts. The city-based environmental exposure course had a second component where students went into rural areas 
and studied in a similar way in detail life in rural um, Gujarat, which was nearby, but they could compare the urban and the rural, the city and the village, the lifestyles which changed as well as the aspirations of the people. So this will give you some idea of the kind of work that came out of this revisualization of the basic program, the foundation program. Uh, <clears throat> the second major department, departure from Bauhaus and Ulm was to introduce a course which looked at problem solving, uh, the problem solving process within design. And uh, uh, Bhandari felt that the design methodology or problem solving process, which was imported into the design curriculum from Europe and America, basically framed the context of a designer and a client relationship. And this is what he wanted to dismantle. And the question he asked was, how then could one introduce students to the idea of design as a tool of development at the grassroots? This was his question. And so he proposed ending the foundation program with a course wherein students were introduced to a methodology which incorporates an individual designer's questioning attitude, his sense of social commitment and his value system in general, hopefully honed by the exposure to the city and the village. The course envisaged a broad-based analysis stage in which each aspect of the problem is studied at varying scales with solutions at each scale. In short, a designer should be trying to deal with the total problem at environmental scale and not with its parts only, not only focusing on artifacts, but in the human environment in which the artifacts are embedded. So grappling with the complexity as well as the ambiguity and uncertainty that this might entail was also introduced to the students. Bhandari hoped that the spirit of attitude building and sensitization would continue when the student moved into their specializations. Uh, he ad advocated periodic reviews and critical uh, reappraisals. In fact, the NID is now poised to relook at its um, um, foundation program once again. Uh, <clears throat> but though it has undergone several revisions in the past uh, 15 or 17 years, um, it still maintains to this day the basic framework and logic that Bhandari proposed. Um, as we speak, uh, a, a few, couple of years ago, NID has been declared an institute of national importance. It's still functions outside the Indian university system, which is why it has been able to maintain its um, autonomy in the decisions around curriculum and pedagogy. Interestingly, as we speak, the alumni of the National Institute of Design, alumni covering the last 50 years or so, have collectivized as the Association of Designers of India. They're organizing themselves into working groups to reframe design education as a whole, to bring it in consonance with the present landscape, to bring to the forefront questions of justice and equality and decolonization along with the economy in both design education and practice. Thus the question of relevance and purpose is a recurring one and one that will claim the attention of each generation of designers. So uh, that is a short sort of summing up uh, of, of the ways in which the curriculum at the NID was evolved and how it had its roots in the Bauhaus and the Ulm schools from Germany. But in response to the Indian landscape, they shifted their perspective and um, tried to uh, respond more fully to the present situation in India as they found it. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Suchitra, for this comprehensive insight and also your attempt uh, to draw um, sort of um, and to develop a narrative or sort of really based on, on your intensive research on the way how also the NID departs um, that it's still existing, departs from its uh, sort of references and attempts uh, to um, um, even learn from the Bauhaus as well as from Ulm and translate it into its 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 very own idea um, of um, of a national institute of design in in India. 
and uh, and so far um what i discovered um now trying a little bit to moderate a discussion between you both since our time is rather <laughs> limited um um, probably there are two uh, distinctive aspects that are quite crucial and you both brought it up. So that's on the one hand, um, the schools essential in a very particular moment in history, uh, pre sort of independent and then post independent, um, are certainly struggling to uh, respond also to the particular circumstances of its times as an educational institution with a radical reform attitude. Um, and trying to translate uh, actually these particular dynamics of its times um, into a sort of um, finding its own way of, uh, of the role of art and design and probably even architecture in society. Uh, so this was a kind of an attempt also to respond to these dynamics of modernization on its, in its own terms. So I think the term of translation is very essential here. Um, since it was really finding out the, your own terms, um, an own way of how to sort of could this sort of dynamics uh, and 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 transformational sort of um, mo uh, moments in that particular times could be translated into um, sort of forms that really responds to everyday life. So the term of everyday life is a very crucial one in your both presentations and the conceptualization of everyday life. And in this regard, even more than the question of the role of the artist slash designer that in a way repositions himself. So I guess to Chitra, you brought it up very sort of precisely that it's not the attitude that there is a designer that in a way serves for a client industrial relationship, but rather than the designer has to figure out what is his particular positioning within these complex problems of the everyday life. Uh, so meaning it's not the problem solving, but it's rather the identifying what will be a role of a designer in this particular circumstances. And probably one could similarly say, moving back to the beginning of the 20th century, um, so looking into the way how these artists in Shantini Ketan were trying to figure out their own positioning within this complicated pre-independent conditions searching out for alternative routes, probably in the more Asian sort of related constellations of Asia and Japan, finding new forms that were sort of in a way resonating their own ideas. So am I right in this condition? So coming back to this, the very idea of the conception of the everyday uh, as, a, as a fundamental shift of the positions of that school, engaging with the everyday. The everyday was different in the 20s and certainly different in the uh, 60s, yeah. So probably, do you want to respond to that question? Should I? Yeah, so just yeah, 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 yeah. you carry on. Yeah. yeah. So um, actually, thank you for sort of drawing the spotlight to the everyday um, life. Uh, that I think is a very useful way of framing the efforts of the NIT. Uh, I think I would add along with everyday life, the classroom and the city or the classroom as a as a kind of contained space uh, and the city that contains the classroom you know uh, so um, perhaps uh, taking sarabai's interest in psychoanalysis and thinking of winnicott who talks about the containing the contained um, uh, kind of um, a container which a student needs. So there's a pedagogical kind of uh, relationship in, in the development of an individual who's learning to be discriminating and make decisions, you know. So um, the everyday along with the classroom as a safe space, the city as a safe space in order to learn your relationship with the outside in which you're going to act. So you learn it in some way in the classroom and then you go out into the classroom of the city, so to speak. So mm -hmm. I, I has thought to extend the concept spatially uh, too, but I'm sure Anshuman would have a kind of suggestion from his end. Yeah, <clears throat> actually um, uh, there are two different looks at it. One thing is that uh, <clears throat> NID was, um, formed when already design arguments were quite rife and uh, I think quite matured. And I mean, in a sense that there were a lot of debates had happened already on design 
and from which they could draw. And in case of Kalabhavan, in its early inception uh, days, it was a kind of uh, uh, totally kind of you know blindfolded experimentation with information. Of course, I mean uh, Tagore had a lot of information, and he was interested in psycho psychology and uh, child psychology and developmental psychology as well as growth psychology. So you can imagine that environment. He would emphasize on environment, and he would uh, Nandalal would translate that into a kind of active. Uh, aesthetic environment, which also includes <clears throat> collective public life. So it's not kind of bereft of uh, public life, like NID has also a lot of similarity, you know, that at the inception, Gira Saravai invites all these ex Shantaniketan people on board, actually. So um, Ritan Majumda was on board, um, uh, Subramanian was an advisor as well. Uh, so you have a lot of people who are ex Shantaniketan who had been on board uh, and at the inception of it. So, however, the design development, design ideas had uh, already grown by the time an idea had formed. But in case of Palavavan, it had an important component to it, which was nature and which included uh, human beings surrounding it. So, and its setting was also a kind of a rural setting. So, in a sense, so uh, as a part of the design development was part of incorporated as a part of the environmental, um, you know, environmentally learning uh, and active learning process. So in a sense, uh, you know, I can't quote from uh, say either Winnicott or Piaget, uh, but uh, won't, I mean, be very definite about whether Ericsson model or Winnicott model uh, would fit in, but there was a, uh, you can see a synthetic model that was being developed over there. It's difficult to point at uh, whether it's, but Gestalt definitely was one of those uh, theories that would sort of be pertinent in terms of uh, multisensory experiential sphere in learning from the surrounding, translating the surrounding into um, both design and what you define as art. Uh, so the subjectivity as well as the purposiveness were playing, uh, balancing each other with each other. So that's what my observation would be. Uh, of course, that uh, designing for modern life that NID was doing had a different dimension. And I observed that it had, of course, like with uh, the later guy that you opened up, the architect who sort of opens it up towards uh, social life, towards anthropological, ethnographic observations from which you derive energy. Um, but that was somewhat in his nascent state, you can observe in Shantani Ketan uh, in a very, very organic uh, you know, uh, way, because there was no strict curriculum. And uh, like Eaton formed a certain kind of curriculum over there. And Gropius said the center of it should be architecture. So I think Eaton and Gropius were conversing quite a bit among themselves in building up because Gropius's main interest would be architecture. So he said, the center of all the design thing is architecture. That is there pronounced in the Bauhaus Manifesto and, <laughs> and um, before the first exhibition also. But Eaton had other interests. He had his spiritual interest. Uh, please correct me, Regina, if I'm incorrect. But he did he, he, Mazdaism, et cetera, was also drawing him there towards the East, towards Parsia and other, other cultures. So, and also towards Gothic and comparison with Indian temples, he sort mm -hmm. of, you know, brought in the craft aspect, the organic daily aspects, etc. where in the background, that they're in the back of his head, perhaps, he was translating them into a modern design program uh, in a programmatic way. Um, however, Shantini Gidhan didn't draw up that kind of program, they just outlined the, um, the modus operandi, that's it, within which you have scopes for interpretation, um, whereas, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. If I may jump in, what is yeah. really crucial is that, I mean, this is, depends also on the on the narratives that has to sure, be formed sure, sure, sure. and different biographies about, about. Mm -hmm. but one has to be very clear that uh, actually this notion of the building as sort of based on this unification of the of all arts and right. crafts right. that could be articulated already in the 1990s was metaphorically meant. So mm. meaning this holistic idea of the unification of all different arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. So this very idea echoes back actually even to the beginning of the 19th century and right. uh, 
reform pedagogies that existed beforehand and where the Bauhaus certainly learned from. Um, but I think what is what is very crucial within this very idea is that also this 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 relationship towards um, craft was newly invented. I think this is also crucial in all of our discussions which we have now today that you both have shown very nicely that there is a strive with the everyday is also an interest into cultures of making. I'm not talking about handicraft, but cultures of making and having an anthropological awareness about it. And I would claim that even uh, one of the sort of remarkable essential elements of, of the Bauhaus productions, even in Dessau, was that this culture of making, so the making, was still um, very uh, sort of um, relevant and, and an invaluable element of the pedagogy in the workshops. And now it comes into this, what we've been also talking about, um, actually the classroom, as the Chishra called it, or I would even expand it towards the campus. So the, the very sort of um, architecture, this kind of the campus structure, it, the, the built environment within which this education took place. And I think this is also a very essential aspect talking about um, the Bauhaus building that has been really a manifestation of the curriculum of the school in all of its different layers, how it's been erected. So the whole architecture structure follows in a way the curriculum from the workshops to the preliminary course space to the auditorium where the sort of school gathers. And the same could, uh, at least this very idea that, that actually the building itself is a third pedagogue you know, with the open structure that, for example, Gira Sarabai uh, sort of designed for actually um, the, the National Institute of um, Amdabad, or even, you know, the merger between the landscape, the environment, and the campus in Shantini Ketan. So, you know, so meaning the, the campus as a learning environment, I think this is very essential, you know, also in the way how we talking about it. And probably before, because our time is really limited, a last question uh, to both of you. Um, that because also the Chitra um, pointed it out a lot, which is also crucial for thinking about these alternative pedagogies, tangible pedagogies, um, is the very notion of professional education versus actually development of creative personalities. This is these are two different right. things. Right. And I was really struck within, and I think this is also a continuous sort of oppositional debate within these pedagogic experiments, you know, mm -hmm. how to negotiate, how to balance actually these two different powerful, in a way, aims, goals that certainly part of um, 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 a school that has to be certain, to a certain extent also educate, had to provide professional education, but, you know, this kind of tension field. So this is probably a last one I would like to address to both of you, your, your position towards that. So uh, as I see it, the aim, this is uh, my own view, of course, many of my colleagues from the NIT may not agree that the basic agenda was to produce a new nation through design and a new citizen, you know, who would, who would have this lifestyle and a standard of living and so on. But in the evolution of the pedagogy, we also see the, the attention paid to the learner who was going to become the professional designer. Would it be a person who could go beyond the rigid education system, learn to ask questions, feel free, develop their own subject locations within the curriculum. So the also a kind of tension between the nation and the individual, uh, nation, the citizen and the individual, you know, that, that tension is also played out in the curriculum. So, but uh, Anshuman, as I said, yeah. cannot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, like there was a kind of uh, tension between tradition and modernity, and uh, in in so far as if you look at Shantini Ketan curriculum, I mean, without curriculum even, so it relied a lot on subjectivity and uh, it relied a lot on how you interpret cultures and how you also get going with a, a modern life because life is changing outside Shantini Ketan. Shantini Ketan as a beginning model was all right, but but when you actually confront the world around, then you have to choose a certain kind of career, uh, make it career move of some kind. Some of the most successful people from there, actually you can see that chose multiple careers and um, became multi-stable personalities and they were multitasking people like Subramanian, you can see very much. Ritan Majumdar was from sculpture. He never was trained as a designer, 
but he moved to design. So that is something. Many people say, Devi Prasad also say that if Shantiniketan uh, hadn't trained them in various craft and art traditions, then they couldn't have moved their career um, easily from one to the other disciplines. So multidisciplinary kind of approach that they had initially uh, was helping them in coping with the outside world. So the education was to build up a new kind of uh, a human being who was independent thinker. So that was the crux of it, the model, and a total human being, a kind of complete human being with a, a kind of a personality, stable personality, who can move flexibly between the disciplines, between the disciplines. So that was already, uh, always already interdisciplinary. So that was quite modern, I thought, as a foundational episteme. Um, then uh, the craft you can learn from anywhere, basically. One became a filmmaker, amazing filmmaker, Satyajitre, and <laughs> without completing his course, he left. He said, whatever I learned in terms of design was from Binod Bihari. So that was his favorite teacher, but also all the other artists actually over there. So that independence actually, you see yielded result, um, even if, um, but I also met a lot of uh, less achieving people. I mean, I'm sorry to say that, but you know, in terms of career moves, et cetera, but they're also complete, they're very, very rich human beings. I mean, in terms of their cultural exposure. Okay, this is very similar to the uh, sort of epistemologies of actually Bauer's pedagogy. So we have, unfortunately, really to wrap up. Uh, and I would like to ask your mister, if, um, if do we have questions from the audience? Shamista? Are you with us? Hello? Yes, of course. I was just <laughs> looking into all the nice comments and uh, I will recheck again, just refreshing it. Okay. I think we have just a few minutes left. Uh, so, in yes. order to. <laughs> so, this is uh, a lot of people are watching this and thank you for that. But if you do have questions, this is uh, possibly the last chance to ask. No? Okay. Regina, unfortunately, we don't have questions, but uh, <laughs> okay. Dipankar Gangupadhyay Dipankar, Dipankar has uh, really uh, given all of you a very big compliment, thanking you uh, all. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. But then, so um, uh, in so far, um, I guess we we all, uh, even in this ninety minutes, um, had not sufficient time really to discuss in its length also this uh, sort of contradictions, sometimes even misunderstandings between also you know the way how historiography um, has operated in describing actually also the dialogues, uh, conversations between uh, these three different schools, if I may say. Uh, so there's still a uh, fascinating scholarly work uh, to be done. Uh, but I guess today sheds light on a variety of aspects and documents and research that you both, Anjuman as well as Suchitra, have uh, at least achieved in the course of your scholarly work. And for that, my great thank you. And uh, um, also, I <laughs> really much appreciated uh, this kind of discussion and uh, hopefully we have the opportunity to continue once up in time in real life <laughs> and not only digitally. So thank you so much for both of you um, for, uh, for this valuable input uh, for today, for today's evening's discussion, because for me it's afternoon. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Thanks to Sharmishta. <laughs> Suchitra, Regina, of course, <laughs> and yeah. thank you very much. Well, uh, there's a lot of thanking to be done, but uh, as uh, Regina rightly pointed out, any discussion uh, about the connection or the disconnect of uh, Bauhaus and uh, what happened in India uh, can go on forever, actually. Many, many interesting things can come up. So uh, I hope this will give you some food for thought and uh, generate your interest to come and visit the actual exhibition uh, in the, in, at the Indian Museum. It is truly a one of its kind. And uh, uh, the exhibition is uh, 
obviously it includes both the collective uh, the research exhibition of the Bauhaus in Magenista and uh, in addition we have a response from uh, another artist uh, very well known art practitioner and uh, also a teacher at the Kalabhavan Chancha and Kosh uh, so in, we invite you all to come and uh, thank you very very much Anshuman and Chitra um, for the thank for you. coming in, and Regina, we can, we cannot thank you enough. You have been an integral part of the whole process. It is sad that uh, we can't have you all together at the exhibition physically to have more discussions, and um, uh, you know we could meet so many people. But I guess things are opening up, and one day we will all meet, uh, and that too soon. Thank you viewers uh, for your time and we invite you all to the next session in October, which is on the relevance of Bauhaus today, another uh, moderated conversation between Kaiwan Mehta, Suchitra is going to be there and Alison Croshaw from Nottingham. So see you all. Uh, if we don't see each other or uh, meet, uh, our viewers before the celebrations of the Durga Puja begins, uh, we all wish you a very, very happy festival season from our side, this part of the world. Take care. Good night. Thank good night. you. Thank you.